So Norm Kester started his ophthalm ophthalmic, easy for me to say, coatings company in his Rogue River garage 15 years ago. Uh, today, Quantum Innovation Innovations has 50 employees and they sell their products all over the world. Um, along the way, Norm put two principles in place that have driven growth and made his company one of the best 100, 100 best companies to work for in Oregon. So please give a warm welcome to Norm Kester. So uh, just to uh, just to back up a little bit before I start my presentation, um, you know, at being an entrepreneur, there's a lot of things that you have to endure and a lot of things that you have to go through. Uh, like uh, like Rick said, I, I started this company uh, 15 years ago in my garage uh, when I moved here in 2002. But I'd already started two companies prior to that, and both of those failed miserably because I was, besides being an idiot and being young. I, I really needed to learn a lot about what it took to start business and, and really understand how to do things. I went off and I started businesses for other people and that's where I really got my chops. Uh, I, I, I don't have a formal college education, uh, so I learned all the things that I learned, either reading, I'm a, I'm a voracious reader, uh, or doing things, you know, uh, a school of hard knocks, right? So, uh, so I learned uh, when I started running a, a company uh, for the first time, I was 27 years old. I was running a $14 million a year company, and, uh, and I didn't know the first thing about how to read a P&L or how to cash flow a business. And so the smartest thing I did is I hired a CFO, and I sat with her every day, and she taught me. So because I had to, I, had to, I was responsible to people in Switzerland uh, for what we did on a, on a daily basis. So. So what I, what I thought I would do here for you guys today is put together uh, this uh, treasure map because along the pathway of going through these journeys, we learn certain things, right? We learn how to, how to run a business, how to do certain things, how to, uh, how to manage people, how to do these sort, all these different things. Um, and so what I wanted, to, what I wanted to, to, to really present to you guys today is is there's some major nuggets along the way, but there's one really major nugget. There's a treasure at the end of this map that I, that I want to talk to you guys about. And when I started this company, there's a book that's been written uh, uh, now, but when I started this company, there was no book, there was no template about, about this major subject that I'm gonna talk to you about. So um, as I get started, I'm going to uh, I'm going to present to you guys. I stole this from Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. I was at Trevor's presentation. When was that last month? Uh, up in Grants Pass, and Trevor gave away books. And I thought that's brilliant, right? If you could just give away knowledge, and that's something that we do all the time at our company. That's what we say our currency is. That's what we trade in. We trade in knowledge. If I could give away knowledge, if I could give you something that you could walk out of here with today that was meaningful, that was meaningful to me and Trevor did the same thing in his presentation, then I thought that would be immensely beneficial. So the way that this is gonna work is, every time you see one of these blue X's, the first three hands that go in the air are going to get a book. So let's practice, three hands. Did you guys watch? <laughs> so this is, these are my Vanna Whites over here. So, so we gotta, I, I know he was he was the first one. After that, I don't know what happened. Now there's going to be there's going to be six different books, and they're all meaningful for different reasons. After you raise your hand, I'll tell you what the book is. Now I'm not going to tell you the worth of the book or anything like that until after you've committed. Know this though, you only get one book. There are 18 books total. So feel you know if you're a gambler, you know take put your hand up quick or wait till later. There's, huh? Yeah. Well, when when the blue X is up, did you already give away the three? Yes, he did. Okay, you gave away you gave away the three. So the first book is getting things done. This is a book that we give to all of our new employees. So this is a book that I read a long time ago, and this really helped me when I was a young person. I was 25 years old. I was on the road 10 months out of the year, and I was managing 14 people. I didn't know what I was doing, and I really wasn't very good at it. So, and what I couldn't do is manage all the, all the things and all the people and where they were around the country. So I really needed to figure out how to simplify my life, right? And uh, this was before email, before cell phones. 
Uh, so I had to figure this out. And I read this guy's book a long time ago. So we give this to all of our employees when they first start. So remember, what are you going to do when the blue axe goes up? <coughs> Unless you're gambling on the worth of the book. Because that there are three really, really phenomenal books and three just phenomenal books. So, so if you're gambling. Are they different colored X's we can look for? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to just, just contextualize this before we get into the actual meat of the presentation, as, as I stated before, I started my, my journey in, in the corporate life working for it. When I, when I first got out, I went into the military right out of high school. When I, when I started my, my trek, I got out of the Navy and I moved back to Minnesota, which is where I'm from, and there are some Minnesota people in here. Yeah. Uh, then I started a company. And again, I failed miserably. I was, I was at that point, I was 23 years old. Didn't know the first thing about it, but I had a company car, had a really sweet chair, and I had great cards. I, I nailed that part. <laughs> Everything else, I burned through my, my, uh, my cash. I had $20,000 in cash. I burned through that, man, really fast. Didn't have one customer, but again, I had a really sweet chair. Uh, so I went to work for, uh, for some other people, and um, and during that time, I really grew. And by the time I was uh, 28 years old, I achieved the American dream. I made my first million dollars when I was 28 years old, right? So, but what I quickly found was, is that the American dream? Is, that, is, that, is the dream really there? Is it about making money, right? So as a 28-year-old, as a oh, did you see? <laughs> Yeah, I saw a couple of them. Right. And which book? Which is the book? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to do uh, phenomenon. Seven Habits. Seven Habits. This is a really strong book. So this book has probably changed more lives than just about any other book outside of the Bible. So with I forget how many millions of copies sold, I teach on this, I teach classes on this book. This book I give to my kids, I give to high school kids, I talk a lot in high school kids, I talk a lot in colleges, I talk all over the country. This book is the number one book that I give out. This book changes more lives than any other book out there, I'm pretty sure. So if you read the pages and you listen to it, you'll, it'll change your life too. So what I found was when I made that million dollars, and by the end of the, at the end of, the, of this, this uh, period of time, which was uh, in the late 90s, I, I had made almost $4 million. I was one of those tech millionaires, right? And, but what I found was I was probably clinically depressed. If, if, if I were to have been assessed at that time, I was so messed up because I thought I had achieved what, as a 14-year-old, and I wrote all my lists, and I had done it all, and I, I made a million dollars, and then when I got there, when I, when I crossed the finish line, Happiness wasn't there. It was empty. It was void. And, and I really didn't know what to do with myself. It wasn't until years later that I could really reflect on it. But I was really, really sad. And I was running a very large organization. At that point, we were doing uh, 20, 20 some million dollars in turnover. And uh, we were reporting to Switzerland. I was flying all over the world. I was in Milan, Italy. I was in Switzerland. I was doing all sorts of stuff. And I was sad. And I couldn't figure it out. So, greatest thing to ever happen to me, I lost it all. I lost $3.8 million in a week. It was fantastic. At first I was a little bit like, there goes my boat. Uh, but it was, it was a rebirth. It was the greatest thing that's happened in my adult life. I lost almost $4 million. And I could start over again. And once I took the money out of the equation, then I could really start to get back to figuring out what it was that really drove me, what made me happy, what was gonna, what was gonna drive joy in my life and in my family's life. So, <laughs> that's actually me. I was a lot shorter then too. Uh, I, uh, I packed my bags. I love that company. In 2002, I left that company and I had some crazy non-competes, as you can imagine. So I couldn't even talk to people in the industry. That's how 
uh, rigorous my non-compete was because I hired most of the people that were in the in the US uh, industry and I was the expert in in this particular field so I couldn't talk to anybody for six months uh, so so but I was on a journey and that journey was kind of exciting when I when I moved out here I actually thought I was gonna open a vineyard then I read the books on how you grow vines and how much time it takes and all the pruning and I threw the book out the window so that was that was on the way here I, I figured that out really quick so what I did was I built an office in my house in Rogue River and I did a lot of soul searching and I did a, I read a lot of books that I thought were really interesting back in my time when I was coming up if Anybody remember when Fast Company magazine started? Anybody remember that? How cool that magazine was? Change agents and all that. So we're going to change the world. We're going to change business. We're going to do all stuff. I loved that magazine back in those days. And I felt like I was one of those people, but I felt like I didn't really do it. I was a corporate person executing a corporate mantra every day. So I really was trying to figure out what, what was it all about? What was I going to do? <laughs> Right. Which one are we doing now? Uh, Maverick. <laughs> the Maverick. So this book that I'm about to give you guys, whoever was the first three people to raise your hand, this is one of the books that we founded our company based on. So this guy uh, took over his father's company in Brazil. And uh, his name is Ricardo Simler. If you yeah. leave out of here, amazing. Google... Go to YouTube, do whatever you want with Ricardo Simler, and just watch some of the stuff that he's, he did. This guy is amazing. And he took his father's company and, you know, he tweaked it a little bit, and now it's a gigantic multi billion dollar conglomerate. And the stuff that he wrote in this book is just amazing. And so, what I wanted to do during this time when I was, when I was sitting in my garage, I was rereading this book. And trying to figure out how could I take some of these things that this guy wrote about and that he did taking a, an entrenched company and turning it around uh, I'm not going to give you any uh, uh, spoilers to the book you got to read it it's fantastic uh, but I based a lot of what we do at quantum on the content of this uh, of this book uh, the Maverick or sorry it's Maverick don't google the Maverick you won't get it it'll be a it'll be a Western so what I what I really figured that I that I wanted to do and all that soul searching and what I got one of the main things that I got out of this guy's book is he was really disruptive. He he looked at every single component of what they did in their business and again, these guys had an entrenched business. I forget how old it was, Trevor, do you know? No, it was no. It was pretty old at the time and it's yeah. in Brazil. So there's a lot of machismo, there's a lot of hierarchy, there's a lot of all this stuff going on and I think they were making like uh washing machines or refrigerators or something like that and and it was a large company and so he, what they really looked at is why are we doing it this way why is it done this way why do why do companies form in this way how do we have why do we have these structures all these sorts of things and one of the things that I really took away from his book was every single thing that he looked at everything that he touched he disrupted he said I'm gonna look at it a little bit differently and I thought, I want to do that. I want to. I want to think of it in the way that will really be disruptive to the the common ways uh, that things are done. So, the way that I thought that that would translate is in the way that we do business. So the way that our business is structured is is completely with consistent with my personal values. When I was at this company that I worked at before. It was almost the separation of church and state. When you're at work, you behave this way. When you're at home, you behave this way. It's just business was a mantra, right? We could totally screw over whole groups of people because it's about the money. It's not about the people, right? So it's just business. And if you use that, that term, it's an excuse for a lot of bad behavior, right? So what we did a lot of times is we screwed over people all, all the time. We made millions and millions of dollars, and that was okay. And I thought every, you know, I'd, I'd leave and I'd go home, and man, it just did not sit well with me in my gut. So 
Uh, so the, the other thing that we decided that we would, or that I decided that we would do is we wouldn't bow to existing ideas or mantras. So I wanted to look at it in a different way and I wanted to look at it and say, if we could do it the best way, what way would it be if we started a business in the best way? And we would always apply the golden rule, right? So do unto others as you would want them to do unto you, or there's a thousand versions of that. So be disruptive in how we sell our products. And so what we, what we started with is we gave away all of our stuff, right? We gave it away. What we would say is, if we can't make your life better, if we can't change what's happening for you, my customer, don't buy what I'm selling. But if I can, which I think I can, if I can, then buy from me. And everybody said I was crazy, that this would never work. So the other thing that I said that we would do was we would always look to serve without any care for monetary gain. And that again, we were told was just crazy. So we would get calls from customers, and this was my idea. We would just help. We would just serve. We would do whatever was necessary, and we wouldn't care if we got uh, any gain at the end. So in our products, we wanted to be, I wanted us to be disruptive. If we were gonna be disruptive, it had to be in all channels. So in our products, so no Me Too products. What that means is, if it already exists in the marketplace, I don't wanna, I don't wanna touch it. Somebody's already doing that, I don't wanna be involved. If I can do a times 10 value adder to something that's currently being done, then I'll, then I'll participate. But if I can't, I don't wanna be involved. So, uh, and then the other thing is, if we, can't, if we can't bring the iPod to our industry, we also don't wanna be involved with that, right? So those are some of the things that, that we wanted to do and bring into business as a whole. So how was I going to do it? Now this, was, this is where we get into the kind of the meat of what this talk is about. How was I gonna actually walk these things out and how would this actually translate into business? So what I felt like I really had to do was I had to empower everybody that worked for me. What I wanted to do was multiply myself. What I wanted to do was make people. If my values were what the company was going to be structured on, I needed to hold everybody else accountable to those same values. So in order to do that, I had to grow all these people. In order to do that, I would have to empower them. So what is a literal translation of that? Everyone in our organization knows every single dollar we spend. It's open book. Everybody knows what everybody else gets paid. Everybody knows what I get paid. Everybody knows what we spend our money on. Everybody knows the financial condition of the company. We've never had a layoff, we guarantee that. Have we, have we had to cut back when everybody got paid? Yeah, and you know what happened when the recession happened? Everybody got together and said, first of all, let's cut our medical expenses. Our medical, we cut medical. The, comp the, the, the employees got together and cut their own medical. Then they said, let's cut our retirement. Cut the retirement out, because we're not gonna lay anybody off. The next thing they did is, we're all gonna cut our pay by 30%. All of them got together, at the time there were 14 people. They all got together, they all cut their pay by 30%. It wasn't enough. So then they found this program through the state where, where uh, we would, I forget how it worked, but we, we basically paid them for three or four days and the state paid them for a day or something like that, but we never lost an employee. And, and when in 2009, one year after the recession started, man, we started growing. We grew all the way through the recession and we just crushed it. Our recession happened a little bit earlier because we lost our biggest customer. We lost $85,000 a month in revenue just like that because a company in China bought one of our biggest, uh, well, actually was our biggest customer at the time. So empowering people was being completely transparent and the other thing was, no, we had no management. So we were empowering everybody to make all the decisions. I felt like if we gave everybody, the, everybody a clear understanding of what we were doing financially, everybody a clear understanding of how the business worked, then they could make a decision. So we had people making $100,000 decisions all the time. But the other thing that we got out of that was, we had people that were working in shipping on day one, 
and are now today running departments of our of our business making 70 80 grand right that's what we got out of that because we empowered everybody so out of that I felt like if we empowered everybody and we had the right right people on the bus we would create innovation innovation would be coming off of us like crazy and so came to us in uh, 2008 or 9 whatever it was I don't remember I said hey you know what we have a huge carpal tunnel syndrome issue with our employees uh, making glasses can you help to solve it don't know but <laughs> Can we look at what you're doing and try and figure it out? But we'll we'll try, and uh, and our guys, you know, our guys just rallied around that whole that whole problem, that whole idea, and within within three weeks we had them a a mock up of what we thought would work. Now it was literally rubber bands and a little bailing wire, and I think there was probably some bubble gum. We we put a little disclaimer on there: don't open the box because it could fall apart. But it, it did work. And they said, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And, uh, and now we've sold, Tim, how many of those have we sold around the world? 300, 400? Yeah, yeah. I think 350, 375 right in there. Yeah, so. they're all over the world now. That little machine that we made to, to end uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So innovation, oh! Who do you feel it was? Oh, we got a couple of candies. Which book is there was one right here. Where? This one here. Right here. Okay. Help it. This one right here. Sure. And this one right here. Okay. <laughs> Which book are we doing? Okay, so this book is the goal. I don't know if you already have it, Trev. Don't actually. Have okay. It. What? You got it. So this is the goal. This is an extremely meaningful book. This this guy wrote the book that started uh, the theory of constraints. So the theory of constraints. If anybody's ever heard of drum buffer rope, or uh, or if you have a Herbie in your organization, and how to how to remove the constraints out of your organization to uh, to help your organization grow. Uh, this is. This is, as he says, this is building on the shoulders of giants. So this is built off of the Toyota method. This, uh, this is one above the Toyota method. Uh, and this is an extremely good book. Now, he writes it in a way where it's kind of a novel and he's, he's delivering the principle at the same time. So he's solving the constraint in a marriage while he's solving the constraint in a manufacturing uh, facility at the same time. It's a great book, great read. Yes. Uh, when you read it, it'll be he's in a manufacturing plant and he's got his he's got his family that he's he's dealing with. But don't think of it as a manufacturing book. Theory of constraints applies to everything that you do. Read the back of it. You'll see some practical examples. Really, really great book. So, what I did was I started the company based on these core values. At our core, we believe in the individual. I believed that most corporate structures are around the two to three percent of people who are the anarchists, the crazy people. The, so we, we, we build all these substructures around the crazy people mm -hmm. instead of building it around the people that are good. That I, I felt like most people get up every morning and they don't go, you know, put their pants on and go, man, I just want to suck today. I'm just gonna mail it in. I get it good. I'm gonna show up and this is just, oh, horrible. I'm gonna be horrible today. No, I mean, we get up. We wanna we wanna move the ball, right? We wanna contribute. We wanna be helpful. We we wanna do something. But but we structure our companies assuming that everybody wants to mail it in and that people want to do harm. So I said, no, we're gonna believe in people and we're gonna structure our company with that belief first. So the other thing is, we were going to believe in servanthood. So we were going to believe in serving others first. First and foremost, whether that's each other, whether that's our vendors, whether that's our customers, I didn't care. So just a practical example of that, when, when somebody comes with a semi-truck and delivers us goods, we send them inside and we get them something to eat and something to drink. We take the stuff off the truck, we clean their truck, and then they leave. We want to serve them. Now guess what? They line up. 
to deliver to our place, right? We have a long list of people who want to drive for us. We have drivers within these companies who fight to deliver to our location because we serve them. They know that. They understand. It's different. They like to just hang out with us. We have, we have vendors that just come and talk to us. We have vendor appreciation dinner. Some of you guys, Jim, you've been to our, one of our vendor appreciation barbecues, right? We have people from all over the country come to our location to have a barbecue. And we just hang out and we just thank them for the day, right? That's, that's the practical walking out of what that looks like. And the other part was we're all in the same boat. So a rising tide raises all ships. And I felt like we all were in the same boat no matter what role you play in the organization. And, uh, and that needed to pull through everything that we did. So we made two basic principles that we were going to, to, to live by in all of our business transactions. The first one is virtuous business cycle. So uh, uh, what we just call virtuous cycles. So uh, this is a traditional virtuous cycle. I'll show you first. Anybody got an MBA in the room? There's one. You've got one. So it, when you, oh, you've got one. Sorry, I didn't see you over there. Uh, I don't have one. So uh, I'm with the rest of you guys. Uh, but, uh, but this is one of the things you want to create a recurring revenue stream, right? A, vir a virtuous cycle. This is, this is something that's taught in most MBA programs. So this is the definition of a virtuous cycle or a closed loop recurring revenue stream. So this is what it practically looks like. So you have cash flow to invest, compels, you compel, you you improve, you get around, you create more revenue, you invest in it again, and you continue to grow, right? This is how most companies, they want to, they want to create one of these recurring revenue streams. A lot, of, a lot of companies, this is the sole focus, right? How many recurring revenue streams can you create? Most banks are centered around recurring revenue streams, right? Interest and that sort of thing. So, so this is a standard methodology. So what I wanted to do was take this and turn it on its, on its ear. If we were going to be disruptive, this is what it's going to look like. So what I wanted to say is we're going to take a virtuous cycle and we're going to take the money right out of it. This is our virtuous cycle. So what we do is we look to serve, do the right thing every time. Customer calls up and says, I got a problem. We don't say, can they pay? We don't say they didn't pay us last time. We didn't say that they're 90 days past due. We say, what, what can we help you with? You need somebody to come up there and help you? Sure. Yeah, we'll come up there. We'll do it. And we'll worry about the rest afterwards. So a, a, a great example of this was there was a guy down in Oklahoma, and he was losing business like crazy. He had a problem, but he was losing business like crazy. When I initially visited him before this problem happened, it was a thriving business. He probably had 18 employees. He was, doing a, he was making a lot of glasses in his location. When I went down, when his problem happened, he had two employees. He went from 350 pairs of glasses a day that he was making in his heyday down to two or three. He lost all of his customers. And I said, look, Tom, I can help you. I, I'm not going to charge you anything. I just want to solve your problem. You've got a problem. I can help you. And he said, nobody does anything for free. This is an Oklahoma guy, right? I mean, he's, tried and true Oklahoma, true blue. And he said, no, you can't come. I won't let you come to my place and help me. Nobody does anything for free. And luckily his wife was there. And his wife said, Tom, you're losing everything. Let him come down. So I flew down, I fixed his problem, and then I got in the car with him and I went to see all of the doctors that he serviced that he had lost his customers uh, from. And, uh, and I was able to get him back about 30% in that one day that I traveled from doctor to doctor in the car with him. Got him back about 30% of his business. Now, what I didn't know was Tom had another business. I didn't know Tom from Adam. I didn't know Tom at all. He had another business. He made a component that was in every lab in America. Every lab making glasses. His other company, people bought this, this special drill to drill mount uh, uh, lenses in the frame. So Tom calls up everybody he knows and said, you got to do business with these guys. Let me tell you what they did. That's our virtuous cycle, right? 
I didn't gain anything at all from Tom. Nothing. Now, six months later, Tom was my customer, right? Because I helped him. Not only did he do that, but he got me 11 other customers. Tom evangelized for me. That's our virtuous cycle. So we look to do the right thing. We create that valuable interaction. That's what I did for Tom. Then he was very happy, right? Because I stopped the bloodletting at his business, turned his business around. He evangelized to everybody that would, that would listen. And he would call me up, Tom. He'd say, Norm, I got another one. I got another one. It's so-and-so in, in this state. Okay, Tom, I'll call him right away. And, I was, and he was just so happy to be helping me grow my business, right? And through that, we'll gain. Now, we may not gain monetarily, and there's probably about 30% of what we do where we don't gain at all, right? Has anybody heard of the glasses that, uh, that solve uh, color blindness? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody heard of that? We did that. There were some guys that were at UC Berkeley that had an idea. And that idea was, we could take eyeglasses and make this crazy coating on the eyeglasses, and it could solve color blindness. But they had a problem. How could they make it? They didn't know how to make anything. So I said, I'll help you. I met them at a, I met them in, uh, in New York. I said, I'll help you. We'll make those, we'll make it for you. Now they didn't have it quite refined, right? And they didn't, you know, they, they had theoretically had it, right? But they didn't, they didn't really have it right. And we made it, we fixed their problem. And one of our guys is colorblind. That works for us. And I said, Eric, Try these on. I want to see if there's anything to this because, you know, when I looked at it, I'm like, this is a nightmare. I mean, it's, whatever. I would never wear these. Eric put them on, started crying. Eric saw red. He never saw red before. Don't. They got something, right? So I called those guys up. Hey, we made it. Proof of concept, go. What did I get out of that? Zero. What have I gotten today? Zero. Nothing. Didn't get a thing for that. We're working right now in taking glasses and turning them into a piezoelectric microphone so that deaf people can look at somebody and amplify sound only in the direction of where they look. Because the problem with hearing aids is you amplify all sound. We've been working on that for how many years, Tim? Three years, I think. Three years. It's an 80-something-year-old guy in, in, in Oklahoma. I don't know what I have with Oklahoma. I don't know what it is. But, <laughs> but now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm like, i got a thing for Oklahoma. But, uh, but yeah, Wendell, he's got this idea. He's got a good idea. We just got to figure out how to get him through proof of concept so we can make it. What are we going to gain out of that? Nothing. We don't intend to. But they're going to tell other people, and we're going to have a story to tell, right? It's okay. That's our virtuous cycle. So the other thing is, is we wanted to start with servanthood. So we have this saying, attitude of servitude. So in all of our interactions, we want to serve first, right? And that's pulled through our virtuous cycles as well. So one thing that you can never say in our company is, that's not my job. You never say that or you're out. That's your last day. That's your last minute. Because you should always be looking to serve. You should always be looking to help. Always. There's no job that's too low for me. I was washing dishes yesterday, right? I'm changing the light bulb. I'm doing it. It doesn't matter. We're all in the same boat. I'm looking to serve everybody. So that's the attitude that we have to have in everything that we do. I'm not going to drill into uh, any, any of these uh, subtitles. But that attitude of servitude, when we have meetings, we met this doctor. Tim was there. Uh, we were in Las Vegas for our semi-annual show in, in Las Vegas. We have two, one in Las Vegas, one in New York. Uh, Las Vegas is in September, New York is in March. And we were there, and we meet this, this doctor. And this doctor just bought a lab. And this doctor walks up to us and says, well, hey, you know, just getting to know you guys. What are you guys about? And you know what he got out of, got out of my guys in just two minutes? You guys are different. What's up with you guys? Because you know what we did? We didn't even give a rip about his business. We want to get to know him. We want to understand him and what he was about. And we wanted to really create a relationship. We wanted to figure out how could we serve this guy, Dr. Blake. That guy gets back from Las Vegas and writes me this long email. 
I don't know what the hell is wrong with everybody at your company, but I want more of it. I don't know what it is. And, and I told him about this principle. And he's said, okay, you guys are nailing it. You guys got that servant's heart thing down. Because we were cracking jokes, we were doing all stuff, and we really wanted to get to know Dr. Blake. Now, Dr. Blake is an evangelist for us, right? Because we're different. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't try to, to get anything from him. We were trying to give to him. So it's completely different as a business. Okay. Oh man, tough one. Were you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they was, both got books that time. I think. Yeah. <laughs> this was more for them, and you know what we could get out of watching them try to figure out who it was, because they didn't know when these blue blue X's were coming up. So the this, the next one is habit. Habit. Power up. The power of habit. Anybody read this book already? Habit? Yeah. Yes. Amazing. I know you read it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I made you read it. <laughs> yeah, That's Seth. different. Seth up front. Seth. Up front? Oh. This, this book is absolutely amazing. Uh, anybody who's read it knows. This will completely change your your idea there's a guy in this book which I think is just phenomenal he has a traumatic brain injury and then every day he gets up he can't remember his name he can't remember anybody around him but every day he gets up and makes himself eggs and bacon so now everyone in the science community they cannot figure out how this guy does it right he can't remember anything else but there's a habit that was formed and somewhere in his brain he's able to get up and make bacon and eggs he gets the he gets the plate out, he gets the pan, he gets the eggs, he does all this stuff. Now, he gets lost if he walks outside the door of his house. He gets completely lost. Can't find his way back home, but he does this thing. So they study this guy for how many years was it? Like 18 years or something. His daughter says, yeah, you can study his brain. And through that comes all these great revelations on how we form habits and how we break habits. Good habits, bad habits, all those different things. Uh, so it's a really, really phenomenal read. Uh, he has another book out. Um, his uh, Duhigg is his name, uh, and it's called uh, uh, Smarter, Faster, Better, or something like that. Is that it? Yeah. Smarter, yeah. Faster, Better. That's it. It is it. Yeah, another phenomenal book. You guys just uh, nailing it as an author. So, so has has our organization worked? Has have these principles worked? It's a fair question. I could have listed a lot of different things. There's some things that I'm prouder of than others, but I thought I would do this in practical business sense. I'm really proud of the people that we serve, the philanthropic efforts that we're involved in because we do a lot in the community and our people do a lot. We match, we take 1% of gross revenues and put it in a bank account. Anybody wants to do anything in the community, we'll match it. You wanna go, we had a guy go to Honduras, I think it was Honduras. He wanted, to, he wanted to put glasses on, uh, on poor people. Great video, makes me cry every time. But he wanted to do this. So he said, hey, we'll pay you to go, we'll pay your expenses to go, and we'll get the glasses for you. So he went to Honduras with a friend of his and put how many thousand pairs of glasses for these people that they have never been able to see it just crushes your soul and this was so, this was his passion and we say we'll match you if you're willing to do it we'll match you and so we do a lot of that stuff but a lot of these things are just practical business things so um, I never know my audience in these cases so this is our 15th year so that all by itself is an accomplishment right so uh, we are gonna put 2.5 million in payroll in the Rogue Valley this year. So we also have one of the highest average payrolls in the Rogue Valley as well. We're almost $50,000 average payroll. Uh, so, and that's across 52 people, so that's pretty good. We've only lost, and I say lost, because we know exactly where they are. Uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and two of them we fired, because I don't want customers that I don't like. I want customers that appreciate us. And I had a customer that called me up and went through this whole rigmarole. <laughs> Tim knows the story, he's already laughing. But he said, after he went through all of this whole rigmarole, he said, 
you, you got to have a conversation with this one guy that works for you. Like, okay, well, what about? I mean, Jesus, sounds really serious. I was on my way in Foothills Ranch, California, a customer of ours. You may have heard of him. And so I pull over to the side of the road. This is serious, right? So, yeah. The guy stole from us. Stole from you? Holy man, stole. One of my guys stole from you. What happened? He broke the tip of a screwdriver and didn't tell anybody. Oh, you haven't paid your bill in six months, and you're calling me about my guy, who is one the guy. This guy has integrity coming out of his ears. He, I don't even think he's capable of stealing. This is this is my guy, right? And he says he's stealing from him because he want he wants to negotiate for his bill. He hasn't paid in six months. So I said, you know what? You're fired. I don't want you anymore. And I hung up. And he's still not our customer. Now the other one I fired, uh, because for other reasons, he called me and did his mea culpa, and so I took him back. Uh, but and I won't get into his reasons, but they were special. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're the number two company in the U.S. doing what we do. So we're only behind one company, and that company is, what are they, 30 billion? Small company. <laughs> yeah, we're right behind those guys. <laughs> we're right in behind those guys. And they keep trying to buy us, but we keep saying no, because that's not what we're about. And of course, we were voted one of the top 100 companies in Oregon to work for. We stopped participating in these surveys, and we're, we're more, we do our own happiness surveys internally now, and we're really focused on how we make our people happy. Uh, so we do that now instead of doing these these uh, more um, statewide focused uh, deals. Oh, someone over here. One there, one there. <laughs> we had one in the front here. Right here. Right here. Okay. Thank you, sponsor. Oh, it's up here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Try it. Look me up. I've got another one. Because <laughs> that's the last book, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, so now this book is Start With Why. So now this is the book that I, that I wanted to, that I said at the beginning. This book wasn't written at the time. The man has got one of the top ten uh, TED Talks of all time. Uh, Simon Sinek is his name and this book is really phenomenal because what I want to leave you guys with today is you have to answer the question why or you're going to be like me adrift on that boat somewhere uh, when I went through that really dark period I didn't I didn't have the answer why I was chasing somebody else's dream I was chasing what was defined to me as an American as the American dream but for me that wasn't it so if you don't know what your why is, you're going to have a hard time. When you're up against, i got to make payroll and I don't know how I'm going to do it, when it's hard, when your wife or your husband says to you, why are you doing this? I haven't seen you in the last three weeks. you got to know why or you're not going to make it. you got to know why. So this book is phenomenal because he sets this kind of pattern for you. And he talks you through all this. You can also watch the TED video, which is a condensed version of, of the book. But it's an absolutely phenomenal book. And this is, this is really a synopsis of, of what Simon Sinek says in his book. He's got this golden circle principle, which some of the stuff he talks about with the limbic brain and, and all this stuff. Or limbic, uh, what is it? Is it, is it limbic? Limbic. 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 limbic? limbic brain. and. And all these sorts of, I don't know about that mumbo jumbo, but I do know, that, <laughs> I do know that you got to have the why figured out, right? I do believe that the what and the how, a lot of people know that they're selling a, a widget, right? If you don't know why you're selling the widget or why your customer would buy the widget from you, you got a problem. You're going to be up against the ceiling right off the bat. You got to figure this out. And if you do this in the beginning, if you start with the why and you understand your why, that's for you and for your customer. Why would somebody buy from me? Why am I doing this business? A lot of other things are going to take care of themselves. 
So I highly encourage the, the why in all of this. And for me, it was I wanted to be disruptive, and I also wanted to grow people up in the way that I think that they should go. I think that we should have principles, and we should have character, and we should have integrity in all things that we do. And if I could get that infused into everybody, our business would take off. That's why I wanted to have a business, and that's what I wanted to do. So my encouragement to all of you is to get involved. Get involved in the community outside of understanding your why. This is a little virtuous cycle that I wanted to create for you guys. Get involved in this community that we call the Rogue Valley here. Uh, there's a lot to do. There's a lot that we're involved with, as I said. I'm going to list four up here that, that I uh, personally either chair or am driving uh, these different organizations. There's one in particular that I think, if you have a business, you should be involved with. Uh, serve others in the community. If you do that, in the end, you're going to gain. The community is strengthened. Then uh, this whole community becomes a better place for us to live, for our kids to grow up in. I want my kids to stay here. My kids are all in their 20s now. Uh, and I want my kids to live here. And I want them to feel like this is a great place to live. And that is your responsibility. That's my responsibility, right? It's not somebody else's, it's ours. So if we do this, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a greater community. And in the end, you win, right? It becomes a, a, a greater place for us all to be in. So now here's four groups that, that I personally am involved in. Obviously this, is, this whole thing is being put on by So Ready. If you're not a member of So Ready already, join So Ready. I don't know how much it costs. I used to know, uh, but it's not much. And that goes back into developing this community. But the one that I, I, I wanted to, to say that you guys should all join, if you're, if you're a business person, be part of this so big group right here, Southern Oregon Business Innovators Group. We meet every month. And what it is, it's, it's me. Anybody know Cropper Medical here in Ashland? No Cropper Medical? The president of Cropper Medical and me and uh, you've been there, and about five other core businesses, business leaders, owners, we sit at a table and we wait for you. And all we want to do is help you. And we talk about HR issues. If you want to talk about HR issues, we talk about things like uh, the uh, R&D tax credit, right? We brought, in a, we brought in a speaker, a national speaker, to talk to us about uh, about uh, R&D tax credits. What did it cost? Nothing. <coughs> We're just sitting there. And we pour into people and we help businesses grow. And that's what we do. And we sit there and uh, Scott Shumway and I, we started this group, we took it over when, uh, when the recession killed the group that was the predecessor of this, which was SOPEC. Not even gonna tell you what that stands for. It's a whole lot of letters. It didn't mean, it didn't mean anything to me. Like, Why would I wanna join that? Uh, this one, uh, Business Education Partnership, is the next one. Trevor and I are part of that. Anybody else, Business Education Partnership? Little thing like we're trying to change the education system in Southern Oregon. So we want to change everything about the way the education system is done so that we can ignite a passion in kids, and then they'll find their purpose, and then they'll go to school or do an apprenticeship or do whatever, and then feed this community. The businesses that are here start another business we want to create maker spaces incubators we've got maker spaces that are going in all over the valley now there's a whole, so all this action that's happening and it's all coming through this group this business education partnership we met yesterday yeah yesterday yeah yesterday morning yesterday morning yeah yesterday 7 30 <laughs> 7 30 a.m yeah we've had the governor at our meeting we have the head of grants pass uh high school uh, the superintendent of schools for men for all these all these guys plus all these businesses plus RCC SOU, RCC, SOU uh, Oregon Tech new president I met with the other day uh, and we're we're changing something it's really cool I love that group the other one is the Rogue Workforce Partnership that I'm involved in I don't know what it takes to be on that I don't even know how I ended up on that thing quite honestly but it's really cool because we're trying to solve problems in people who need to find work and uh, and it's a really cool thing to, to get involved in I just encourage you guys 
if none of these sound interesting to you, find one, get plugged in. Uh, there's something out there for everybody, for all of us to get involved in. Um, and you okay. win again. You win again. <laughs> all right, that's it. <laughs> Questions. So questions now I can open it up to any question that you want to talk about. It doesn't have to be pertinent to this. Um, so uh, if you ask away anything, yep. Did you get your six months worth of past due payments? <laughs> so the question was, did I get my <laughs> did I get my six months past due payments? And uh, yes, we did actually. We did get our six months because he didn't appreciate getting fired and he thought that that was the reason why I fired him. But that's not why I fired him. We have people that we've had people that have run as long as nine months past due, and we hung in there for those guys. And uh, be, you know, and it's situational, right? So if we can float the if we can float it and help them, we we had a guy here in uh, Paradise, California, and his two brothers, and the one brother kind of went off the rails, and the other brother brought him out, and. He, he didn't have any money. He was spending all his money buying out the other brother. And I just said, we're going to stick with you. I went down there. I drove over there. I said, don't worry about us. You pay, you pay your debt to your brother. Buy the business out. We're going to be here when it's over. And, uh, and just know we're going to stand by you. And now he's bought all that. He's, he's growing. He's, he's double what he used to buy from us. And he pays within 30 days now. Yeah. Not to monopolize the questions, but... You mentioned that you had lost 3.6 million. Was there a certain business? A3, 3.8. 3.8. Sorry. <laughs> it was almost 3.9, yeah. but not that, not that we're going. Yeah. Was there a certain lesson you learned on that as far as business uh, mechanics or something you would have done differently? On the on the losing on the loss, of the money? Yeah. Uh, no, there wasn't really a lot that I could do. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a poor kid from rural Minnesota. So, I mean, I grew up, we were on welfare. Um, I had several jobs. You know, we didn't we didn't necessarily eat three meals a day. We the first house we moved into in Minnesota had an outhouse and no running water. So when it hit one million dollars, I nearly had a heart attack, and I wanted to take that money out of this. But you can't do that, especially as an executive in a company. There are rules that rules around that. So I had to I had to leave it, and uh, but. I didn't spend a lot of time trying to reverse engineer the loss of the 3.8 because it was a blessing to me and my family, you know, and my wife looked at it the same way. She looked at me and said, you know what, look, I, I worked at the casino cleaning ashtrays and you pump gas. We're going to be okay. It doesn't matter. So bygones, bygones, you're going to land on your feet. It's okay. You got a rock like that behind you. It's a lot of things get easy. Yeah. The business education partnership, how would one get involved in that? Is that on the Soap Ready website or how uh, it's not particular it's not through So Ready. It's a okay. it's a joint group. Uh, the person the person that's the uh, that's the uh, what's that? Dana. Yeah. Dana Shoemate is the one that is the uh, is the organizer. Dana Shoemate and Kathy Troutman. Kathy does work oh, at Kathy. So Ready. Uh, I'm the cat wrangler, so that's what, that's my job. I said this is all like herding cats when I was first meeting, and they said, "Oh, you should be in charge." Like, Fuck. How did I get that screwed up? But hold on, I think he's first, right? Uh, I really appreciate your principle of serving and not being concerned for monetary gain. I am curious about the transition from working free for someone who evangelizes. 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 Yep. Tough word to say. Yep transition between working for free and beginning to build. Okay. Say a little bit about how that happens. Okay, so his question was, how do you transition from giving away your service or, or your goods to, to actually uh, turning that into monetary gain? So for us, it may not come through the individual that we, that we served, uh, but generally speaking, what happens, like in the case of Tom, I go down, I help him, and then I did, I was able to help him, I was able to impact his business, and then uh, it was just papering the transaction. At that point, he was, okay, so how do I, how do, how do I become a customer of yours? 
So then it was a short period later that we worked through the, the contract, which our contracts are really just a handshake. Everybody in our business laughs at our contracts, but the funny thing is everybody honors them because it's one page. We're going to give you some crap. You've got to buy the crap from us, and then we're going, to, we're going to license our intellectual property to you. How do you feel about that? Sign right here. That's basically it, and people honor it. So now, in the cases where we don't have a direct um, a sale, what we like in the case of the guys from Enchroma who started the, uh, the curing colorblindness, they're going and talking about the people that helped them to... So right away, we got another guy from... I forget where he was from, but he, he had a he had a patent idea on on um, putting a coating on glasses to stop the xenon light headlights uh, from from uh, from nighttime vision. Uh, but we weren't at that point. We weren't really interested in helping, and he was trying to you know hey I'll give you all this stuff and yeah no we're we're just not gonna do it. But generally speaking, people evangelize for us, like the guy that we're doing the uh, the. Um, the hearing aid, the piezoelectric microphone for hearing aid, that, that guy is telling everybody about us and we're we're just helping trying to trying to help them get it across. So I don't know if that answers your question directly. It always comes back to us. Sometimes we just don't know how it how it got there. So we we ask, hey, how did you find out? Because we don't advertise. We've never advertised. We we take care of 64 uh, customers here in the United States. We're in Israel, or no, sorry, Israel. Lebanon, Switzerland, India, South America, Mexico, Canada, and almost every state in the United States. And we don't advertise, we never have. Somebody has to tell somebody else. So, yeah, maybe. I'm going to evangelize for you. Okay. Um, I'm with an organization called Living Opportunities, and we support people with developmental disabilities. I first heard you speak at the Soul Ready annual conference a few years ago. First of all, I'm at work with Working skills is amazing. But um, came up to you after a lot of throngs of other people and said, Would you mind if I called you and talk to us? Not thinking you'd ever return an email, pick up a phone, and you did all of that. And fast forward to today, and you have two of our job secrets working there. They love it. You guys are amazing. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to work with you. And you're doing all the things that you're talking about. You did it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Just to tag on to what Bailey was just saying, one, one of our people came up to me, and T Tim was in the meeting. So we're in the we're in a meeting. A bunch of us are trying to we're we're, we're strategizing, you know, the next 25 years of the of the company, and we're we're laying down this great strategy and doing all this stuff. Knock comes on the door. Hey, I just I just want to talk about this because one of the living opportunities guys, he's just not able to produce at the right level. You know, we need him. We need him to produce at 100, and the best he can do is 70. You know, he's just—he's happy, and he's like—he's talking to everybody, and he's petting the dog, and he's having a great time. But man, we can't get him past 70. And I and I said, well, Lisa, is 70 hurting us? Is it? I mean, are we are we losing money when we? Because last I looked, we were making 80 percent on that product. Is it? Is it? Is it? causing us a major problem? Is it a quality problem of what he has? No? Is he happy? Is he better? Yeah, I mean, diff, totally different. The guy is so happy, right? These are, these are, these living opportunities people, they, uh, I don't know how you characterize these guys, but they have different disabilities, right? And uh, this guy is so happy all the time, right? And now he's, he, blurt stuff out in the middle of our company meetings and like I mean he tells jokes you can't understand some of them but he's having a, he's having a blast it's a Lisa it's about him it's not about us it's about him we're gonna be okay question you should ask is can we afford another one ask that question can we get another Tavis in here think about that so and she came she came up to me after and said I just want to I just I want to let you know that I thought about that all night and I just forgot my heart and I got to bring my heart to work here because this that's what this organization is about it's about heart as well I mean we do some crazy cool stuff right but it's about heart too and so she was really she was really uh, moved and impacted by that but but that's that's our thought we we're, we're serving 
Tavis. Tavis is never going to win us any awards or create any great new product. We're serving Tavis. That's what that's about. So, yes, sir. So that relates to my question. In, in terms of employees, another talk I heard here recently was emphasized hire slow, fire quick. It doesn't seem bad. So getting a team, a cohesive team, where you really need that, especially in the early stages, we, um, I mean, how do you, this, I don't see how that fits with your model. Well, it totally fits with it. <laughs> higher, higher, slow, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the old analogy where, you know, you go into, a, you go into an interview and, uh, so, oh, so I'm supposed to repeat the question again. I'm getting caught up in the, in the moment here. But uh, he asked about hiring, hiring slow and firing fast. Um, uh, so uh, my answer to that is, is when you go into an interview, I'm Brad Pitt and you're Angelina Jolie. And at some point, you got to figure out that I'm 5'2 and 400 pounds. <laughs> I'm not Brad Pitt, right? Somehow you got to figure that out. And I advocate for a long hiring period because what's really important for us is you got to fit this. We go through a lot of folks, right? Because people come in and you have such entrenchment. You don't, you think this fits you. I guarantee you it doesn't because you went to grade school. You have a mother and father. You have worked in business. You have an entrenched habit, from the book there, and behavior. You believe in hierarchy. You believe that somebody, should, even though you don't think you do, you believe that people should tell you what to do. Well, what happens if no one's around to tell you what to do because you believe in our company that you're gonna find the place to serve and fill that void? That's hard. That having heart, to look at Tim shaking his head, it's hard. You think it sounds great, but it's hard. And some people just don't do it, right? We had a guy from Intel. This guy's a rocket scientist, right? From Intel, he's used to filling out things in triplicate to go to the bathroom, right? Rocket scientist. We couldn't get him to leave his desk. He was just waiting for, I'll move when somebody tells me what to do. Nobody told me anything to do today, so I just sat there, right? So I encourage all of our people, take a long time. We send people on Easter egg hunts when they come in and interview. Like, you gotta find this. You gotta find some somebody named Bob. You gotta you gotta find uh, something in the building that's pink and and at least three foot tall. And you gotta do these other things. And we we put them in rooms and we knock over trash cans and we see if they pick up the trash. And then we we have girls walk by interviewees and they drop stuff. And if you don't pick it up, you're out. You're not looking to serve, right? You're out. We're trying to characterize people that have heart, and it's hard to it's hard to find because people are people are in a traditional uh, mindset. So, are we quick to fire? Yes, quick enough? No, not always. We just let somebody go a uh, couple couple uh, days ago. Been with us for almost two years. Should have done it day two. This guy, rock star outstanding performer crushed it in everything that he did but did he believe in servanthood no did he come to any of our events no did he believe in some of our core principles no and he would tell you I don't believe in any of that crap saved us a bunch of money but that's not what our company's about if you don't if you don't fit you're out you got to fit because we have to serve people and our customers know that we're different because we serve people. So we do, we do that uh, as quickly as we possibly can because we want the right people on the bus. So, but in that transaction, when we let that guy go, we gave him several months pay. We called people all over the valley, give them a, there's nothing wrong with him. And what I always say is you got to try on a lot of pairs of shoes, right? So, uh, you know, not every shoe is going to fit you just right. There's nothing wrong with the shoe. It's you. It's your foot. The shoe is fine. It's just not fine for you. So there's nothing wrong with that guy. He's a great guy, and he's going he's gonna to do really great for somebody. So what we want in that transaction is to honor him, care for him. We're not cutting him off. We're giving him a bunch of money. We're giving him uh, an exit out. We're encouraging him that, hey, this just wasn't the right place for you. But 
We can't have people in our organization that don't fit. Fit is number one. Then tell me what you can do. We've got time for one more question. 58 more questions there. After 3.8 million, how do you look in terms of investing your own personal capital into one to three into whatever the business function is? Uh, so the question was, after the 3.8 million, uh, how do I how do I look at investing and uh, and do I do I invest my own capital in other ventures? And the answer to that is no, I don't do that. And I was encouraged by and luckily I've found people that are that are in this valley that own businesses and they're in their 60s and 70s. And I play golf with them and I have lunch with them a lot. And they've encouraged me in some things because initially I was doing that, and I was I was taking a lot of our a lot of our, our growth revenue, and I was in, I was putting it in different things, and uh, and one of the guys that in, uh, encouraged me that he did that, and if he had just invested that in his in his core business, the gains he would have gained uh, were would, would have been exponential. So what I've done is I take all of the money and put it back into the company, and so that's why we've we've been able to grow like we've been able to grow. And we are about to start another company. Uh, where we're going to try and solve some needs in the uh, in the sunware uh, uh, space, but, uh, but real quick, I think said last one, but <clears throat> I'll just say, Norm's not a fish guy, but he'll give everyone a fishing rod and teach them how to fish. Yes, he spent out, like a lot of time helping me, my business, talking me through, invite me in, show me everything and how he does what he does with his business. He'll sh and he'll do that. I mean, I'd probably just load it up there next week of your time, but amazing. And so, yeah, it's honestly, that's so much more valuable to my company than an investment, for instance, uh, of capital. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. Morning. Yes, thank you yes, so sir. much. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. We have a really uh, uh, valuable gift to give you. <laughs> you're not a coffee drinker, but. Uh, <laughs> We can just give you a little so Thank you very much. Thank you for everything. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, we are going to do two more things. One is stand up and shout. And. I hey! Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me see. So, we have, we have three people. And one of them is Robert. Would you come on up here? Yeah. Thank you. And you really are going to have to shout, and you're going to have 60 seconds to tell us what's on your mind. We'll need whatever. Ten seconds left. Um, I'm doing this, making soap. This is my company. I'm a startup, and I'm in sort of Ashland Talent, looking to get commercial space and go somewhere with this. Uh, natural product soaps made as cleanly as I can make them and as well as I can make them. I'm trying to make a really good product that I started 30 years ago. Why? Because it's me. It's been like dragging itself along with me for 30 years, and it just keeps getting better and developed. So that's what I decided I better do. It seems to be around. Uh, I'm going to leave some stuff over there on the table for people to smell them, and if you want to take one, take them. They're yours. Uh, I'd like to go into cosmetics. I'd like to go into all sorts of body products of the same caliber, really high-end, very good ingredients, predominantly organic. And that's what I'm up to. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, thank you. So we have we have another Robert come up. So Robert Delormier. Yeah, Delormier. Delormier. Take it oh, away. You have 60 seconds to tell us what's going on. What's on your Hi, I'm Robert Delormier. Um, I'm not selling anything. I'm just uh, I actually work remotely uh, for Macy's.com. I'm looking. I'm a big data engineer. And I'm looking to see what is the heartbeat of the valley to see if there's anything where people could use it. As simple as that. Thank you. Great. All right, Robert, thank you. Our final one is Ashlyn. Are you with us here? Come on up. Come on up. So Ashlyn, tell us a little bit about what's on your mind. What, what are you trying to solve? What's going on? Sure. First, I got roped into this last minute, so thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. 
Um, so my name is Ashlyn Warstein, and my name is spelled like Ashlyn. Um, I'm a relationship expert, and uh, that falls under the same category as coaching. You know, there's a lot of different coaches these days. Um, so yeah, I thought I would just ask a quick question. You know, how many people in here could, can, or want to improve something in their relationship? Is there anything you can improve? Or if you're single, you know, is there something that hasn't been working out or that you really want to change in your next relationship, right? We all have something like that. So um, for me, like, that's what I do. Um, we focus on the individual. I meet the individual. We look at your love blueprint patterns, things like that, um, and then figure out how we can improve your relationship. So helping people manifest and actualize their ideal relationships. What I'm looking for, um, so recently I have had to actually act like a millennial and focus on my online presence, which is something I've been avoiding for a while. So um, I'm looking for like a social media assistant and also a photographer for my business. Wow, that's great. Right. Well, don't go away. Thank you for that. Thank you. I would like you, if you would help me, oh, sure. I'd like yeah. you to draw the winning ticket out of this pocket. Oh, oh, oh. I feel lucky, Rick. So wow, the, the pressure. Person, <laughs> go ahead, just like okay. mess them around and grab one. Oh, oh. Well, those ones are out. I'll put it back. We have to be fair. There we go. Okay. Okay. Go. Annette B. Annette? Isn't that here? Oh, that's yeah. 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 So lucky of you. Here you go. You oh, win. Wow. Date, date night special. Great <laughs> ticket, Annette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody want to thank you for being here. It was a great evening. Uh, it's, it's, it's really demonstrates what a wonderful place this is. If you have books that you already have read, and you want to trade them, hold them up right now. Everybody hold up a book they want to trade. No way. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, thank you very much for being here.